Greetings. I'm Justin Rothschank, here to invite you to join me and more than 40 other potters from around the country for the 11th annual Michiana Pottery Tour on September 24 and 25. You'll find a list of all the participating potters, links to all our web stores for online shopping, a tour map, and more information at michianapotterytour.com or on our Instagram page at Michiana Pottery Tour. I hope to see you there. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 432 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, I talk with Takoro Shibata, who's a working potter and the director of Starworks Ceramics in Star, North Carolina. In our interview, we talk about settling in the area after a degree in chemical engineering and a ceramic apprenticeship in Japan, as well as how he has used local materials to develop an aesthetic in his wood-fired ceramics. We also discuss his forthcoming book, Wild Clay, Creating Ceramics and Glazes from Natural and Found Resources, which he recently co-authored with Hitomi Shibata and Matt Levy. You can find that book now on Amazon or wherever you buy books. Before we get to this interview, I wanted to thank some of the folks who have recently donated to the podcast. We are listener-supported, so I'd like to thank Julie Jung and Osa Ato for their recent contributions. If you'd like to get involved yourself, you can do so at talesofaredclayrambler.com slash donate. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Let's start talking about your pre-ceramic training because you were trained as an engineer, right? Right. I study, yeah, chemis, chemical engineering in college. What was the orientation to that? Was the idea that you were going to then go work in, like with a biotech firm doing engineering, like chemistry, chemical engineering, or what was your plan? What was my plan? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, um, so, so I studied, uh, engineering of chemistry and then my uh major or focus was organic chemistry so after i graduate uh, college maybe working for a company who need uh, knowledge about those or general chemical knowledge uh, to the job but um i kind of uh dropped off to the art side <laughs> <laughs> because uh so I like chemistry. I love chemistry, but also I like art too. And my father's brother, so my uh, uncle, he is a graphic designer. And uh, when I choosing the college, I asked him, um, I'm interested in art and then maybe want to go to art college. But he said that uh, mm, it's really difficult to make a living with the art so if you like chemistry and art maybe chemistry might be a good choice <laughs> and then i uh, thought so that time and then i went to the college uh, for the chemistry but i i still like to do some artwork too and uh so i went to private art school during I'm in the college learning chemistry, but also went to a, a private art kind of a school to learning um, drawing or painting or a basic thing. But um, 
so then I my I graduated uh, college as a chemist. So I didn't go to um, any art uh, related um, job, but I went to uh, um, I chose I chose no I took a job as an engineer in printing company. And I started working for printing company for a little bit, but I didn't like it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so maybe the job was good, but that time the printing uh, company is changing their way from manual uh, process to the digital. So my job was kind of do, using many computers to do the printing process. And then the printing company have many uh, technicians who cut the film to make the uh, printing materials. But it, it was kind of a strange situation to me to teach the computer skill to the very skilled uh, uh, printing uh, uh, person people uh, to do the job. And also I, I, didn't like sitting in front of the computer all day long. So that's kind of uh, uh, difficult uh, for me. And then I uh, tried um, pottery making classes and then I really liked it. <laughs> so it's kind of a um, dangerous decision uh, but I wanted to learn more pottery making. So I decided to quit my job and then um, found my teacher in Shigaraki, uh, which is one of the largest pottery village in Japan. And uh, so I went to uh, do the apprenticeship with uh, my teacher, um, after I quit my job. So my parents are upset <laughs> because it's not really <laughs> what I learned or what I should do for the job. Um, but I didn't want to regret my life. If I could make a living, but if I don't like the job, what I do, I, I didn't want to go through that for many years. And even if I couldn't make it, I want to at least try, um, even if it's failed. So I decided to quit and then went to Shigaraki and then uh, start running pottery. With that apprenticeship, you had, you had talked about how you were looking at the computer all day, but but I, I, I feel like Japanese apprenticeships, you often have to start at the bottom. So I'm sure at that point you were sweeping, wedging, all of the sort of day-to-day -day functions. So your skill set really changed <laughs> from the computer to wedging clay all day. So can you talk about those really early days of the apprenticeship? Yeah, like you said, it's more like maybe typical Japanese apprenticeship, I guess. Um, I sweeping the floor and uh, wedging clay for my teacher for a couple of years and uh, watch and learn. So I watch how people do and then learn from that. So, uh, so I did apprenticeship with my teacher. His name is Hozan Tani. Uh, he's third generation potter in Shigaraki, but um, he his pottery have a employee. No, em, employee is the em, the people who are working, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So employees who are potter, so they are working as a team. So it's not like one person in the studio, one potter in the studio. So there are like five potters um, in one pottery. And then the uh, pot pottery, the Tanikan pottery uh, as a team. So everyone try to develop new clay bodies and then grazes, and then we get together and then uh, share the information about testing result. 
and then we invite uh or like we ask we the company asking uh to bring ceramic engineer to see if that's the good direction or maybe should should try this way so the ceramic engineer Kensaku Matsumoto uh who are also the uh Craig companies and Grace companies um uh, um president as well but he came and he taught us uh, those technical thing uh through our job and uh so I learned from my teacher, but also I learned many things from the other uh, potters who are working there. So that was great. And uh, so, um, but my job was sweeping floor or whatever I could do. So clean up the bottom of the pots and then deliver those pots to the uh, galleries and stuff too. And then I learn how to fire the kiln. Then I start firing kilns, gas kilns, electric kilns, and then uh, start doing more slab work because slab work is a little bit more easier to manage than uh, throwings. And uh, I start making lots of slabs, and uh, and then and then start running throwing a little bit. So that's just a ongoing process but at the same time I make I'm wedging clay for uh, my teacher too but I I didn't know how to wedge clay but I try really hard <laughs> so <laughs> when when I wedge and then the uh my nail was hitting on the table I I didn't know where but I keep doing and then I didn't realize my nails are completely worn because it's hitting on the floor of the table all the time. So I, yeah, but I learn how to wedge clay without hitting my nail on the table. And then little by little, it's get better. In Shigaraki, how common is that style of apprenticeship where there might be multiple people in one studio, including apprentices? Is is that common? Mm, it's... I can say it's not too common. Some people do, but many people who are young artists work for pottery um, as an employee. So they come and then uh, do the like uh, throwing or um, hand building or grazing. So. If you graduate at uh, college, then you might um, start working there as a job. And then also you uh, could use some studio space or you could rent a studio space in town and then make your own work. So that's uh, the other way. And also there's a ceramic research institute in Shigaraki. And then they have a um, job training um, program. So if you want to learn how to throw parts, then you could uh, be in the institute, a research institute, and then learn how to uh, throw parts. And then if you pass that in one year, and if you want to learn more about grazing, you could go back to the institute and then learn about uh, grazing or clay. So those are the other programs that you could go through and then start working in the uh, pottery in Shigaraki. So it sounds similar to the U.S. in that there's a lot of different ways you can get into clay. You know, you can kind of go a more traditional route or you can go an employee-based route. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of Americans know Shigaraki, the Shigaraki style based on the clay, which is kind of a rougher clay with inclusions. I mean, not all of it, but, you know, some of it. How common is that style within the greater town? Are most people making that style of work? And is that what, what you guys make? Not all the potters making that wear. So that's more traditional shigaraki wear. So using shigaraki local clay, which has those feldes feldespathic rocks creating white speckled. 
and uh, fired in the wood kiln. So that's one kind of traditional way to make shigaraki ware. But uh, many of the new wares are not that. I think uh, people, uh, shigaraki potters using some grazes and uh, some kohiki ware, the uh, red clay with the white strip and then the uh, clear graze on top. So there are many different variety of grazes to make their ceramic ware. So ratio, um, I don't know, probably 20% like traditional style and then maybe 80 for other wear. Um, but that's already 20 years ago though. Sure. Yeah, hey, I'm sure it's changing all the time. Mm-hmm. At some point, you guys come to the U.S., and, and I think it was Cub Creek, right, that you guys worked at first? Was that the, the residency that brought you to the States? No. Um, the first uh, place we came is uh, Massachusetts. So we, Hitomi and I um, were young potter in Shigaraki, and uh, like you said, Shigaraki Ceramic Cultural Park, Art Center, Hubbard, ceramic um, artist in residency program. And uh, the artist coming from all over the world and then stay there and they walk there. So that's a great place to meet um, international artists there in the town of Shigaraki. And we met many of them and uh, we interested in outside of Japan, but um, we need uh, money and time. Then we don't know if we could do it, but he told me applied for scholarship to Rotary Foundation. And uh, he told me uh, got um, the scholarship. And then she decided to go to UMass Dartmouth. And then uh, I came with her. So that's the first time we came to US. And that's 2001. And then during uh, Hitomi, Hitomi is in school, I went to a couple of uh, art center uh, to experience American ceramics. And uh, one of them, uh, Peter's Valley Center for Crafts. And uh, I had a really great time. And uh, um, because of the... Bruce Dennard, who used to be a director or used to be a head of a ceramic department. And uh, we, yeah, I enjoyed there. And then he told me finished her program in UMass. And then we wanted to stay a little bit longer. Then uh, we um, heard about Cub Creek and we visited once before. And uh, the director, John Jeshima, accepted us as a resident. And then they just started. So they didn't have many people at that time yet. So we are first batch of the Cub Creek resident, but that's 2003. And we stay there for seven months. How hard is it to get visas when you're doing residency programs? Was that easy at that time or was that difficult? Mm, I... Don't know. I mean, he told me had a student visa, and his spouse uh, could have a student visas for spouse, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, I could get uh, through he told me his, uh, visa status, and then the J visa could do like cultural exchange, like a visa. And I could uh, stay there legally for uh, as long as the Hitomi is in the States. Yeah, because I know the, the visa process sometimes can be long and arduous. I saw it on the other way going to, uh, I worked in China for years. And so getting the visa was, that was tricky. But if you had a job, it was a little bit like Hitomi's situation. Like once, once you had the connection, it was easier. <laughs> getting the first connection is the hard part. Yes, exactly. So when we came back to Seagrove in 2005, 
I had to get a H-1B visa. That's a working visa uh, for Star Wars. And that was a little bit more difficult than students' visa, I guess, because I think more paperwork. And the, yeah, the company who hiring people and also our side, we have to provide many informations too. So as you moved around to different American centers, what what are the things, and now that you, you are running Starworks, what are the things that you notice that are different about the U.S. sort of residency circuit than, say, in Shigaraki or other Japanese centers of ceramic production? Mm, yeah, in, in a way, it's pretty similar. The residency program usually... Uh, you create your own kind of a goal and then work uh, towards to that. And uh, I think it depends on the facility you go. So if you go to Shigaraki Ceramic Cultural Park, they have a good uh, studio to build large scale work. And uh, they have, uh, so you, the studio to the kiln room is uh, flat all the way. I mean, the concrete floor. So you can bring forklift to the studio and then pick up the piece and then move to the uh, kiln room and then load a uh, piece uh, to the gas kiln by the forklift. So it's really great uh, space to um, make large scale work. But also Shigaraki is a historical pottery town. So they have a uh, anagama or a climbing kiln there and you can experience those. And also you can connect to the local Shigaraki artist as well. So that's a Shigaraki resident. And then like uh, Cove Creek, that's uh, Appomattox, Virginia, which is middle of nowhere. <laughs> so we don't have anything outside of Cove Creek, but they have a, a wonderful clay behind of the studio. So uh, we always wanted to touch uh, local raw clay from the ground when we came to the U.S. And uh, we enjoy uh, testing using those local materials. And also uh, there are a little potters community, like uh, when we move a little bit to east from Appomattox, there's a little town called Farmville. And then the Farmville, they have a, Longwood University, and then the um, former professor Randy Edmondson and uh, his wife Cricket Edmondson, they have uh, wood kilns and they have a uh, uh, little pot potters or uh, artist community there to connect. So we, so when you go there, you see the community and also what they have there, and then. Uh, you need to find your own goal with the facility. Or if you could choose before you go, you need to check what you could do there. And then you could um, work towards to your goal in that residency. And you mentioned that you were interested in using raw materials um, in the U.S. Can you talk about your path to that? Like feeling... Is it because you're trained as a as a chemist that you're like, oh, I know science, I can figure this out? <laughs> or did you have someone that really taught you, like, this is a way of working with raw materials? I think uh, I study making pottery in Shigaraki, and uh, Shigaraki have a unique clay, and then uh, they know how to use that clay to make it work. And then when you go to other pottery villages like Bizen in Japan, they have totally different clay, uh, local uh, raw clay they can get. And they have to fire very differently from Shigaraki clay. So they, their clay have a, um, organic matter or uh, the materials that create gases. So they have to fire a really long time, like three weeks or four weeks to fire the clay. And also a little bit lower temperature than Shigaraki. But they know the low, carbon, low clay or materials and then they found the best way to use it. So that makes me, um, I think that's the 
good way to approach to make pots to me. So that's why I interested in local raw clay uh, wherever I go. And then when I went to Massachusetts for the first time, I was hoping to see like local raw clay from there, but uh, I didn't see anyone use local materials there. So I couldn't really touch or see because my potters uh, commit the I didn't know many people at that time. If uh, now I could probably find more people who use local uh, clay, even in Massachusetts too. But anyway, so that's uh, my thought. And then when we came to Cup Creek, we saw clay just behind of the studio, but nobody cared, nobody really didn't use it. But we were so excited. It was in the middle of the winter, but we took the socks out. I mean, if he told me and I took the socks out and jumped into the clay mud and then collecting the <laughs> clay. <laughs> so then, uh, yeah, when we had the chance to come visit Seagrove area and uh, many uh, people using local clay and then creating very unique, beautiful pots. So that's... Um, what that's uh, the part I like. It's challenging because you have to test and then find the way to utilize it. But uh, during that process, I could learn or I could discover something interesting uh, for the materials and then I could use that to uh, my work. There's a there's a famous saying that I think is attributed to um, Soji Hamada, where he he talks about that it's better to make good pots from bad clay than bad pots from good clay. <laughs> wow, that's a great uh, word. It was. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, do you think there are bad clays, or do you think it's just there's clays that don't fit what you want them to do? Right, there are no bad clay. All the clays are good. I mean, if you um, cannot use by itself, and then you might say, oh, this is bad clay, but you could uh, maybe use different forming techniques, or maybe you can uh, add a little bit of other clay to make it work. So there are many different ways to make it work, but uh, all the clay is so unique. And uh, all the clay is good, my understanding. But like you said, maybe some clay not good uh, for your work. So maybe you cannot choose this clay, but maybe other people like this because that fits on their work. Yeah, when we did the wild clay panel a couple months ago, it was really nice to hear you guys talk back and forth. I think there's like three or four of you on the panel. And someone had said that if if a clay doesn't work as a clay body, that just means you need to make it into a slip. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and I thought yeah. like that's practical. Like there's no reason you need to build with the clay if it has if it's too rough or if it's not plastic enough, just make it into a slip. And and that's been a lot of um, layering of things has been a lot of your work. So can you talk about sort of your orientation to a slip and the clay and how you figured out your aesthetic? So, yeah. So when I was in Shigaraki, I was making those uh, kohiki ware, so dark uh, iron, high iron clay body with the white gray slip and then uh, clear grays or matte grays on that. So that's always fun or in interesting to me that the clay body and then the clay strip reacting through the firing to create depth in this surface. And if I just fire clay, that's in, in one way, it's fun, but if I put more layers, then that create more different textures, colors, or patterns on the piece. So that's how uh, I work on my piece. And then, like you said, if we get uh, like one bucket of clay, and then if I need to make a clay body, 
then it doesn't go wrong way. But if I make a clay strip, it lasts for a long time. So if I find some interesting clay, but I just have one bucket, and then that's uh, good materials to make clay strip and then apply onto the surface and then use as a part of my work. Can you talk about when brush strokes become decoration and when they're just a method to get the slip on? Because there's some parts of your work and, and uh, Hitomi's work where you have this sense that like you're decorating with the brush and then other times it seems like this is just the way you get it on. <laughs> sometimes mm -hmm. it seems special and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> can you <laughs> can you talk about like figuring that out depending on the form you're you're using? Yeah, he told me maybe a little bit different than me, but I use the decoration is part of the texture like it's not really decoration. It's another layer of materials putting onto the piece. So that's what I was doing in Shigaraki too. I didn't want to really draw something specific thing on the on my piece because maybe I'm not good at paint that what uh, I, I cannot draw well. That's one thing, but I like uh, more like materials texture put onto my piece. So then like if I use beautiful brush, I could probably put two nice lines and then that become a drawing. But if I use very rough, like a hakeme, like a brush, I cannot control well. So that's perfect for me. When I put it on, they're just creating the like a mark, but it's not like a decoration. It's part of the decoration, but it's not like a drawing on the piece. And then that gives accent to my piece <clears throat> and then doesn't disturb uh, my form of why my work. So that's what I'm working on it. Well, you said it, Mark, your mark making, your brush style is more about mark making than decoration. And I couldn't, I couldn't think of the word before, but that's such a good explanation of that building up of surface, you know, layers and layers. Can you talk about how once you came to Seagrove, we'll, we'll first talk about Starworks and how you became involved with them, and then how you figured out in Seagrove what kiln you're going to build in fire, because there's lots of different wood kilns in the area that you could be a part of. So uh, friends, uh, so our friend, friends, David and uh, David Stempo, who are local Seagrove potters, and then Nancy Gatobi. Uh, his partner in Seagrove. And they came to Shigaraki a uh, long time ago, maybe year 2000 or 1999. And uh, we met them briefly in Shigaraki, but I didn't speak any English. So I didn't communicate, but I remember them, but probably they don't remember, they didn't remember me. But uh, when we were in Massachusetts, Nancy had a conference in Boston and we could see there again. And then she said, you, sh you guys should come to Seagrove and the fire kiln with David. And then uh, we were not sure if we could do, but when we were in Cub Creek, we found out it's not too far. So we took a Greyhound bus and then came to Seagrove. And then... Uh, yeah, Nancy took us to many other potters in Seagrove area, but also Mark Hewitt and Penland School uh, too. So then we saw beautiful, I mean, amazing pot pottery community in North Carolina. And we wish we could come back, but we had to leave and we went back to Japan. And then I was working for Shigaraki Cer Ceramic Cultural Park and Hitomi was working at Shigaraki Research Institute. Then uh, Nancy emailed us, we got this big building, which is Star Works. And uh, we, yeah, so they are looking for someone who can start the ceramics program there. And then, um, we sent her resume and everything, and then Nancy asked me asked me to come there. And then uh, we 
decided to go. So we sold everything we had in Japan. And then we just took three suitcases and one cat and then came to Seagrove. <laughs> so that's how we came to Seagrove because of the Nancy. And then because of the David, Nancy came to Shigaraki. So just the uh, yeah, friendship kind of bring us to Seagrove. And then when I came to Starworks, it's uh, just a giant building. And then just so much junks on the floor and <laughs> <laughs> no rights walking and so much leaks from the roof. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, Nancy said, uh, here's the broom and the laptop and then start the business. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, we, uh, yeah, I, I sweep the floor and then thinking about what we could do um, there. But main uh, focus was researching local materials there and then hopefully we uh, the hope to set up clay factory process it and then provide those to local artists that's uh, the idea we wanted to try because the seagro potters or like local north carolina potters used to digging clay by themselves and then they make parts with the local materials, local clay, and they fire in their wood kilns. And then that create very uh, beautiful, unique uh, seagrove parts. But um, when people move into this area, and then not many people can afford to dig clay by hand and then test it, set up equipment, taking time to process and then make parts. That's too much for most of these studios. So many of the studios buying clay from other clay companies, which is fine, but then those clay companies just use uh, powder clays from big mines and then blend it together and then adding water to it. That's a good way to produce clay bodies, but it doesn't have any local clay uh, in it. So even if you have a good clay right next to you, you cannot use the materials. So that's, um, we wanted to do something for that. Then, uh, so Starworks, we research clay and then find good clay sources and uh, the, we met ceramics engineer who work at brick company in Salisbury, North Carolina. His name is Stephen Brankenbaker, and he helped us uh, getting some of the clay from his brick mines. And then that's kind of how we start getting clay and then set up the clay factory and then start making up local clay bodies. So that's how we started. And also we set up studio space and now we have a artist in residency program. And then the artists come there and uh, they can focus on their work. But also we have a good uh, clay sources of raw clay uh, in Starworks. So if we, people are interested in local raw clay, they can just go outside in the clay pile and then shovel in the bucket to get some clay and test those raw materials for their research or work too. So that's kind of a good way to um, having both um, fact, clay factory, also studio and the working kind of together. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Amico Brent. For the past 100 years, Amico Brent has been creating ceramic supplies for our community, ranging from underglazes to electric kilns, and they have no plans of slowing down. With over 3,000 products, Amico Brent's top priority is making sure that all of their customer needs are met. From the professional to the student and everyone in between, their high quality materials enable you to make your best work. To learn more, check them out at amico.com or on Instagram and Facebook at Amico Brent. 
You can also show them how you use Amico by sharing your work online with the hashtag HowIAmico. Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration, featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit rosenfieldcollection.com. I think we should describe for the the listener the building that you described when you when you first came there and she gave you a, a broom <laughs> and a laptop. <laughs> the, the reason for that is that it's a former sock factory and it's gigantic. Like it is. Do you know how many square foot that the whole thing is? Mm, I don't know exactly, but Nancy told me like, it used to be five acres worth of the floor space in the building. So it's pretty it's big. Amazing. It's <laughs> pretty big right and it, but it allows you so that on you're on kind of the bottom floor with with the the clay factory um and the store so people can come in and, and buy clay um but what's nice is there's enough space that when you walk in there there are just piles of clay outside piles of clay inside <laughs> you know <laughs> yes. you've got all your clay making materials like your filter press i mean in my mind the the things that really distinguish the qualities of your clay is the the research you're doing into local material but also that you're filter pressing a lot of the clay um, and that filter pressing just makes it so much more plastic. So can you describe for people that maybe don't know what a filter press is, like how that works? Yes, I always um, asking people to go to YouTube and then uh, search filter press. <laughs> so you can see the animated uh, uh, movie that you could understand the process. But I try my best to explain. It's difficult uh, if you don't see or if you are not there. It's so the clay from the ground, it's huge uh, chunks mixing it up. And then if it's a little bit moist, it's hard to crash or hard to um, do anything. Then if you try dry it and then crash with the hammer mills or aurora mill, then that's a lot of dust. And also you crash the beautiful rocks to the dust too. So we choose the wet process, which um, we use the, the wet pro- Okay. We choose wet process that, uh, through the filter press. So wet process is uh, taking the clay out from the ground and then let it dry, but we um, mix that with the water to make a clay strip. So clay strip is much uh, wet than you want uh, to make a pot. So it's like a milk-like consistency. So it needs to remove the water out from the clay strip to be able to make a wet, uh, moist clay. So filter press is for that. So clay strip coming into the many uh, plates, which have a, like, a, um, like a cavity in between the plates. And then it's all connecting. So the first we need to close the press and then sending a, a clay strip into those spaces. And then the clay strip uh, is storing in the pressure tank. And the pressure tank is connecting to the air compressor. So when we increase the air pressure to the pressure tank, the uh, clay strip coming into the filter press, uh, the pressure goes up, and then the water goes through the cross inside of the cavity. Oh, it's so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and and the water goes through the uh, fabric, I mean the canvas, and then the clay building up on that canvas little by little, and then it takes 
four hours to two days to make a solid clay cakes in the filter press. And then we take those cakes out and it's already good consistency. I mean, good, good uh, uh, water consistent. So it's almost good to make a pot. But then we have to put those uh, clay cakes back into the clay mixer and mix it again and then makes it even more consistent and then push it through the the adding pug mill and then put it in a plastic bag and then pass to the uh, artist. So that's the process. And it is long and, and hard to explain, but I wanted people to understand how much work you guys are doing to get the best clay possible. Because a lot of, you know, like the other way of doing it would be like a Soldner mixer where you would just put clay powder in, the mixer is spinning in a circle, you add some water and it tumbles itself to, to create clay, but you don't get even mixing, you don't get even hydration, like it's a whole it's a very different way of making clay. So I, I love that you guys are thinking about it like, we're going to make the best clay possible. <laughs> so how, <laughs> how are we going to do that? So I, I appreciate that as a potter, that you're putting the time and effort to filter press and to you know do the other mixing that you do. Thank you so much, Ben. It's uh, lots of work. <laughs> so we sometimes do a tour to the uh, people to show how we process clays. And uh, yeah, sometimes people come, wow, that's so cool. Oh, but not that's not for us. <laughs> it's too <laughs> much, too much work. But but uh I think that's the best way to process local materials. So we don't create too much dust, but also we can retain beautiful rocks into the uh clay bodies too. So how much time do you spend at Starworks directing the, the clay research versus time in your studio making pots? So I work uh, full time for Starworks. So at least 40 hours a week, I spend time there. So when I come home from work, that's my time for making my own work. But um, I have family, we have two kids, and then, yeah, so I don't have much time. So uh, weekend, I could do some, but yeah. So in the morning before I go to work or after dinner, a uh, little bit, and then weekend, some. So that's I. that's all I have. But um when I started uh, the project, uh, Starworks uh, Ceramics project, it was so busy. I have to do everything, um, taking care of customers, ordering clay and research clay, and then setting up factory, and then testing, processing clay or studio activities. So it's so much to Deal. So I couldn't make my pots for maybe five years or so. But um, I think he told me and uh, friends told me you should make your own work. That's good for your uh, self men mentally, but also it's good for Star Wars too. So if I make my work and that could go to the other places and then they people know about Star Wars uh, through my work too. So it's it was difficult, but I did my best. And then uh, even the volume is not much. I make my work as much as possible. You mentioned that you have a family. So you, you're balancing time with the kids, with, with time with the studio, with time with the factory. Um, and I'm kind of on the younger end of that, that I have a really young child. But you, you have your – how old are your kids now? Uh, to our kids, two boys, 14 and uh, 12 now. So they're moving into their teen years. <laughs> so y you might have some more time ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> right. When they uh, go into college, maybe we have more time. But uh, it's it's been challenging, but it's great. So we don't have any uh, families in the U.S., uh, our 
relatives and families is in Japan. So when we go to NCK conference or workshop or other places, we always have to take our kids uh, with us. And uh, even if they don't like, they are listening, uh, <laughs> people talking about clay and the pots. <laughs> and uh, they travel around the uh, country too. And then, uh, yeah, we are happy to spend time with them as much as possible. And uh, so we have many friends coming to our house and then they could, uh, our kids could talk to our friends and then that's i believe that's uh, good for them in the future too but um yeah the time is always challenging to manage the balance but um i try my best and then he told me it's busy too so we try um our best for the balance for the family our job and uh traveling too yeah i think when the kids are small it's a little bit more different so you you are having uh more uh you have to be with them more but that that's the wonderful time uh i miss them following me <laughs> all the time <laughs> and then, uh, now they uh, don't follow me. We still talk and uh, going to swimming together or something like that. It, it's different uh, stage of the parenting. So with your kids, they've grown up in the states. So their their rural southern North Carolina upbringing was very different than your Japanese up upbringing. Mm -hmm. Do you have a desire to keep them connected to Japan? Yeah, I wish, but it's impossible. Uh, I mean, a little bit, yes. So we had a chance to go back to Japan maybe three times with our kids. And uh, I think second time when we took our kids to Japan, we put them into the Japanese local elementary school and then also put them into my parents home too so they kind of uh experienced the life or school life in japan and then when they had more experience of those even they don't speak or write japanese well but they understand their cultural background uh they have from parents maybe they understand better and uh I would like to try that as much as possible, but it's, I don't know how much we could do. I think about where you guys are in North Carolina. It's pretty conservative country around mm -hmm. you. It is not sometimes the most liberal, open-minded place, but that's all they know. I mean, they're American kids that grew up, that's where they grew up. So mm -hmm. have they been able to adjust to that? Mm, yeah, they grew up here, so it seems okay, but like, uh, I don't know if we, I should talk here for religious thing, but we grew up in like a Buddhism and uh, Shintoism thing. I'm not uh, really super religious, but that's kind of the part of the custom we go through when uh, we grew up in Japan. So I don't really belong to Christianity church around here, but the uh, local people going there, but our kids cannot, don't go there because we are not belong to there. I mean, I could belong, but that's not uh, how I um, believe. I, okay, people going there. So that's kind of sometimes create a wall for our kids to connecting to other kids too for like community activities or maybe religious uh, thinking so they had some challenging uh, time for that when they are in school but uh, yeah teacher tried to help them and uh, we talked to them a little bit about uh, those too and they seems like um 
understanding the difference and uh, okay to be in there. But like you said, it's um, yeah. So there are not many Asian population in our area. So uh, there are a few of the Asian people in the school, and I don't know how they feel about that uh, well enough because I don't go with them, but they seems okay so far. Yeah, and I mean, kids are so resilient. I mean, they just kind of get used to anything. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you're talking about the church life of of that area. When you move somewhere in the South, people ask you, what church do you go to? Like, it's <laughs> like a, it's a saying that people have. But right. what's funny is that when I moved to New Jersey, I've never been asked that. Like, it's just not a thing, you know? So I think that's one of the sort of unique things about the South is the tide of, that the religion is also a social activity. It's not just a religious belief. It's where sometimes people go to Bible camp and go to play basketball and go swimming and, you know, whatever it is. Right, right. It's the same in Japan that uh, some Buddhism, it's uh, not so really religious, religious uh, teaching, but also that's a community place for kids to be. And then they kind of uh, grew up together and uh, that's important part of the community. Well, to wrap up, can you plug the book? You guys have written a book. So can you talk about that and when it's going to come out about raw materials? So book project started um, because Matt Libby who uh, graduated Montana State University in Bozeman, um, he started working with us at in Starworks. And uh, he brought the idea writing book together. And uh, you know, he asked, he told me and uh, me to write book together. And then we agreed. And then we start writing book. That's 2019. And uh, when we start working on, it's much more difficult than I thought. <laughs> Maybe because uh, my English uh, skill or ability to do so, but also my knowledge is uh, very limited too. So we put uh, our experience into our book uh, about the wild clay or like idea um, about wild clay because all the clays are wild clay. <laughs> As you know, so everything is wild clay, but we are specifically called uh, the clay just from the ground is wild clay because now um, I think it's good time to go back to the source or maybe the uh, places that you could find around uh, the print. Sorry. I think it's good to go back to the local sources of uh, clay um, because you don't need to bring the clay from Australia or England to make your work. I mean, that's one way you can make fantastic work, but you can try find uh, other choices that could be local materials for your work. And uh, so for wild clay, it's not necessarily just buying clay from big clay mine, uh, not just a powder clay, but maybe the clay from the ground uh, close by that might be fantastic materials for your work. So we're just suggesting or maybe gi giving you idea what maybe you could do uh, about the wild clay. So that's the um, uh, book about. And uh, many people helped uh, us and uh, John, John Neely, who is uh, professor at Utah State University, he helped me a lot. And then Randy Edmondson, uh, he's a professor, uh, former professor at Longwood University, helped me a lot. And then uh, Starworks Nancy helped me and uh, Bruce Gorson and uh, Samantha's father Ed helped me to check the uh, writing too. But anyway, 
it's uh, so much work. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And you're writing about a technical thing. I mean, we, we think of raw clay as being this like wild thing, but there's so much science involved with what you're doing. So I think writing about, like if I wrote a book about wild clay, it would be a struggle because it's not the way I'm used to thinking about the way I work. So um, I commend you for, for finishing it. When, when does it come out? It's going to come out uh, sometime in October 2022. And uh, we don't know the exact day yet, but you can check Wild Clay book in Amazon and you can find book pre-order there. Or I think uh, Bloomsbury Publishing, they are the publisher and then you can buy book from the website as well. That's a great publisher. Congrats. That's a that's that's good. <laughs> yeah, so many people working there too, but the editors and uh, everyone very helpful and uh, we uh, appreciate all the work they did and that uh, we did our best, but we appreciate their uh, work as well. Well, thanks uh, for taking the time to do this interview. Can can you leave the website for Starworks and for for um, your guys studio so people could get in touch if they want? Uh, Starworks website is starworksnc.org. And he told me and uh, my website is studiotoya.com. And uh, you can find me on Instagram, Takuro Shibata Ceramics as well. But thank you so much, Ben. Yes, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure. I'd like to thank Tokoro for coming on the podcast. It was a pleasure to talk with him and to hear more about his book. That's available now for pre-order on Amazon or wherever you buy your books. Also wanted to thank today's sponsors, the Michiana Pottery Tour, Amico Brent, and the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor on the show or any of the shows on our network, you can get in touch through the website. That's brickyardnetwork.org. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, Or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities whose lands we reside on in the United States and recognize that we are uninvited guests on the occupied, unceded, and ancestral lands of over 500 nations indigenous to North America. By acknowledging and reflecting upon the contemporary lived experiences and histories of the indigenous peoples here and globally, we may begin to take essential steps towards creating a more equitable world. Learn more through the hashtag HonorNativeLand initiative of the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture and consider contributing to Indigenous-led organizations doing important work to further health and wellness, sovereignty, and self-determination of the first people of the lands you reside. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.